So my name is Alex Ramadan and I'm a postdoctoral researcher here at Oxford Physics and I'm the host of the series. The Challenges and Changes series was created to provide a space within Oxford Physics to talk about the social issues which affect the careers of researchers and therefore the research. Our aim is to have a seminar series which exists alongside the more traditional research seminars to discuss actions we can take as a community to create a supportive, diverse and inclusive environment in which we can produce the best possible research. The ethos of this series is that by having an equitable, diverse and inclusive physics community, we can ensure the research that we are doing includes and benefits all. All of our seminar speakers have worked to improve the lack of diversity in physics and the wider scientific community. The series offers a supportive and welcoming environment for everyone to learn and discuss the issues facing our community. My hope is that the series will inspire, encourage and support you as attendees to do your own work to create a more equitable research environment. And we hope to contribute to the improvement of the research field as a whole, not just here in Oxford Physics, which is why all of the talks are open to the public. We all have a responsibility to look around us, see the problems present in our communities and do our bit to fix them. This leads me on to what we ask of you as attendees of this talk. We want these talks to be welcoming and as positive as possible. And there will be time at the end of the talk to ask our speaker questions. All we ask is that the questions are respectful and align with the aims of the series. So there are two ways you can communicate with us during this talk. The first is the chat function. It should be a button towards the bottom, bottom of your screen. Um, and you can use that to message us, the hosts, if you're having, for example, any technical difficulties. And if you want to ask our speaker a question, then there's a Q&A button, which is separate, again, at the bottom of your screen. There you can post questions as the talk goes, if you want to, and then we can pick them up at the end of the talk for the Q&A session. Um, another thing to know is that you can upvote the questions. So if there's a question you particularly want asked, you should upvote it. And then that way we can avoid repeat questions. Our speaker today is Professor Dame Jocelyn Belbanel someone who I am sure doesn't need an introduction, but I'm going to try and hopefully I will do her and her many impressive accomplishments justice. So it goes without saying that Jocelyn is an incredible physicist. Her discovery of pulsars has been heralded as one of the most significant scientific achievements of the 20th century. And she's an incredible role model to so many of us, not just because of her excellence in academia, but because of all the work she's done to address the inequalities within academia. She's spoken about the sexism she experienced throughout her career, and she was pivotal in the establishment of the Athena Swan Charter aimed at advancing gender equality in the UK higher education system. She is the first female head of the Institute of Physics and is a fellow of many learned societies. In 2018, Jocelyn was the recipient of the Special Breakthrough Prize in Fundamental Physics and she used the entirety of the 2.3 million pound prize money to establish a scholarship scheme aimed to fund women underrepresented and refugee students to become physics researchers. So many of us look up to Jocelyn because of her success in a research field, which sadly at times is still hostile to women. She's furthered our understanding of the universe and improved the culture in physics for the next generation of researchers, and in particular those from underrepresented backgrounds. She's also the only physicist to have their discovery be used as the inspiration for a Joy Division album cover, proving the impact of her research, not just in the realms of academia. And I'm so excited now to hand over to Jocelyn for her talk in the Challenges and Changes lecture series. Thank you, Jocelyn. Thank you for that introduction, Alex. Thank you very much indeed. So thank you all of you for joining in with this and I hope you find it interesting maybe challenging, maybe disturbing. We'll see how we go. I'm going to start by talking about where we and where I have come from, and then going to talk a bit about the journey. And then I'm going to talk about where we go next and what are the open issues. If I can move the slide on, I'm fully frozen. Right. So where we're coming from. I started my life in Northern Ireland 
And one of the first gender issues that hit me was at the beginning of secondary school, when the boys got sent to the science lab and the girls got sent to the domestic science room. Everybody knew that girls were only going to get married and be housewives, wives and mothers. They didn't need science. They needed to know how to cook and make beds. However, my parents wanted me to do science uh, and told the headmaster so, as did a couple of other sets of parents. And ultimately, there were three girls and all the boys in that science class. We did physics the first term and I loved it. I thought it was fantastic. And I came top of the exam at the end of the first term. I don't remember the teacher praising me. I do remember him berating the boys for allowing a girl to beat them. We did chemistry the second term, that was okay. We did what they called biology in the third term. We were given flowers to draw, label the parts, learn the names. And then when you've done that, here's another flower to draw, label the parts, learn the names, and so on for the whole term. And I thought that was a bit boring. And I've had a slight prejudice against the biological sciences ever since. I went away to boarding school in England, Northern Ireland, particularly our town was fiercely sectarian, Protestant versus Roman Catholic. And our parents wanted us to have some of our education out of that environment. So I went away to boarding school, Quaker Girls Boarding School in York. And I can remember the headmistress telling us one day that we were being educated so that we could be good wives and mothers. I note that there's no intrinsic value for us in this definition. We are defined in terms of other people. But then two weeks later, she tells us we're being educated so that we can fulfill our potential. And I wasn't sure the two statements were reconcilable. I have to admit, she probably had an eye on what the fee paying fathers wanted to hear. The maths and science teaching at this girls boarding school was typically rather patchy, but I was lucky enough to have an excellent, albeit rather elderly physics teacher, although there was very little lab equipment. I can remember him teaching us about a tangent galvanometer, then opening an educational supplier's catalogue, pointing to a picture and saying, that's a tangent galvanometer followed by, look at the price. And when it was time for the practical exams around O-levels, GCSEs, the school had to buy in quite a lot of equipment. Crates of stuff arrived. I went from boarding school, girls boarding school, to Glasgow University to do a physics degree. I had already decided I wanted to be a radio astronomer and a physics degree seemed the appropriate way to start. Glasgow University had a rather different system from Oxford. Uh, it admits huge numbers of people who meet a minimum level of qualification and throws out 30 or 40 percent at the end of the first year. So there's a curious ambiance about the place. So having started with several hundred in the first year, we ended up with 50 in the honours class for the last two years. There were 49 men and me. It was a bit tough. There was a tradition in Glasgow at that time that when a woman entered the lecture theatre, all the guys whistled, called, stamped, banged their desks, generally made as much noise as they could. And the women tended to gather outside the lecture room and then walk in in a group. But of course, if you're on your own, there's no group. I was living in a woman's hall of residence. And when I went back that first lunchtime and said, it looks like I'm the only female in the class, they all assumed I'd be changing subject. But I did want to be a radio astronomer. And to do that, I had to get a physics degree. 
I went from there to Cambridge. I hadn't expected to get into Cambridge uh, and was somewhat overawed, put it mildly, by the place. Um, it looked lovely. It was full of people who were apparently very bright and absolutely assured of their right to be there. And I felt very provincial and as a female in a very small minority. At that time, there only were three colleges for women. And I went to the newest of them called Newhall, now called Murray Edwards, which you see in the bottom photograph. The upper photograph is the Cavendish lab where the radio astronomy group was. I noticed that at my woman's college, the fellows referred to themselves as Ms, Mrs or Miss. Apparently they felt that using the title doctor or prof, which a number of them were entitled to use, that that was a bit forward. I think what was going on was basically they were trying not to scare the men or upset the men because the university committees that controlled how many women students could be admitted to Cambridge and how many women's colleges there could be were very, very heavily male dominated. For most of my time in the Cavendish lab, I was the only female PhD student in radio astronomy. And as a number of you probably know, and Alex has alluded to in her introduction, it was while I was there that I accidentally discovered a new kind of star called a pulsar. I got engaged to be married between discovering pulsars three and four. And I can remember lots of my friends congratulating me warmly on my engagement, but they said absolutely nothing about making a major astrophysical discovery. There was plenty of it in the newspapers, they must have known. Maybe they didn't understand what it was all about. Or maybe, like many other women, their priority was that women got married. Following the discovery of pulsars, there was a lot of media interest and interviews would take a fairly typical pattern, would be my supervisor, Tony Hewish and I, and they'd ask Tony Hewish about the astrophysical significance of the discovery, which Tony duly supplied. And then they turned to me for what they called the human interest. So how tall was I? Was I taller than Princess Margaret or not quite so tall? What were my bust, waist and hip measurements? How many boyfriends did I have? And the photographers would ask me to undo several of the top buttons of my blouse. They weren't interested in me as a scientist. They were interested in me as a piece of meat, basically. Page three stuff. It was horrible. It was really horrible. And I didn't feel in position to be really rude to them. Um, I'm a final year grad student whose money's running out in a matter of months. I have to finish the data analysis, write a thesis, write some papers, and Really, I just couldn't afford to alienate the, the academics in radio astronomy department. I got married as I finished the PhD. My husband worked in local government. And the way you get promotion in local government is to move to another locality. This is kind of disruptive on the rest of the family, assuming they go along with him. The son was born four or five years later. And there were very, very little childminding facilities because mothers were not expected to work. Indeed, mothers were discouraged from working. Um, it was felt that, felt it was proven that if mothers worked, the children would be delinquent. Absolute rubbish, but that's what society in Britain thought was the case at that time, or thought was expedient to be the case at that time. Now, at that time, over 50 years ago, getting married was considered to be the peak of a woman's career. Furthermore, the medical profession was inclined to tell you, regardless of what your ailment was that took you to the surgery, that everything would be okay once you had a baby. 
again, absolute rubbish. But you see the kind of pressures there were on women then? I was lecturing at the University of Southampton at that time. And I remember that um, when the lecture timetable came out, there was prof this and doctor that and doctor each other and Mrs. Burnell. The secretaries had changed doctor to Mrs. thinking I would prefer that. Sure. I was at Southampton when I became pregnant and I went to my head of department to ask what maternity leave I was entitled to. Maternity leave, he said. Never heard of it. And he was right. The university had no maternity leave provision at that time. I'm sure it does now. And there were other ways in which a married woman was not visible as a person in her own right. Um, for tax purposes, a married woman's income was part of her husband's income. So she had to tell him what she earned. He put it on the form and then he signed the form. She didn't sign it. We were trying to be innovative and we wanted our first telephone directory entry to be in both our names, M and SJ Burnell. It wasn't allowed. It would be too long, they said. They said they only printed the name of the head of household. Fortunately for us, there was in our area a gentleman with a name something like Lieutenant Colonel Algernon Thistlewaite, KGB, KCT. And he had all that in his telephone book entry. So we won the argument that M and S J Burnell was not too long. Because of the attitude to women, they were really considered rather dim quite often. There was an awful lot of mansplaining went on. And if you did work, everybody assumed you were a secretary and you were treated as such. And some people I can tell you are extremely, extremely rude to secretaries. My husband moving jobs at regular intervals disrupted my career. I have career in inverted commas there. Um, it was really a succession of jobs. I'd find a job in an astronomy place relatively close to where my husband was working. We'd write a begging letter, get the kind of job you get when you write a begging letter, and gradually work my way up the ladder. Then husband said it was time we moved, time he moved. And so I slid down a snake. Till in the new place, I wrote a letter to the nearest astronomy establishment asking if they might have a part-time job for me. And they usually could find some bit of money for a part-time job. And I would climb up a ladder there and so on. So my career is very, very unconventional. It is not half as glorious as people make out. I have been on the technical staff. I have been on the support staff. I have had research positions. I have had lecturer positions. I have had head of department and dean positions, but it's very, very varied. And I flitted backwards and forwards across the electromagnetic spectrum research wise. My experience of being a physicist, I've lost, yeah, okay. My experience okay, so far, it's often been other women, my knowledge, never a man who has asked, are you sure you want to do physics? It's women who are the custodian of custodians of what it's proper for women to do. But in a male dominated area, of course, it's largely men who determine the advancement of people, including the advancement of women. So interesting bifurcation there. Come on, move on. So which slides seem to have frozen. There we are. So I want to say a bit about the history of the road to equality in UK universities, because I was quite heavily involved in some of that. 
uh, you can imagine data are collected about how many men, how many women there are at each level in the university. And surprise, surprise, it shows women are in a minority. And furthermore, the minority gets smaller, the higher the rank, the higher the level. It also shows that women progress more slowly up the ranks than their male counterparts. It shows that women put in fewer grant applications for smaller sums of money, are less willing to apply for jobs, etc., cetera, et cetera. So the first response to this was fix the women. Make the women braver, more willing to put in grant applications, to apply for promotion, to apply for jobs, to put in bigger grant applications. And believe it or not, they ran special training courses for women to address these deficiencies as they were seen. Now, the snag with this attitude, well intended though it is, it assumes the problem is with the women and that there's no problem with the way science is run or the way society is run. It's all the fault of the women. Nice, easy solution, isn't it? Then they thought, right, we'll do some special funding for women. They created return or French fellowships for women coming back after a career break. This was tricky because there was a risk that people said, you only got that position because you're a woman. This has actually been said for a woman. You only got that position because you're a woman. You're not up to the standard of this department and you're pulling the department down, you should leave. So increasingly those types of funding, returner funding, those are open to both male and female. So people can say, I got it in open competition with other men and women. I got it because of my qualities. Then the funding agencies began to realize that giving special funding to women, whilst a great help to those women, did nothing to change the way the Institute the University was run. And they began to look for what they call institutional change, making a place fairer for everybody. At around about this time, I started meeting up with a few other senior women scientists. We were wondering what on earth we could do to make things better for women in science, because we knew there weren't enough. And we knew that those that there were were having not the best of times. So these photographs are some of the key figures in that group. It was this group that created what's known as the Athena Swan Award. And the brains behind it were Caroline Fox, who's the person on the bottom left. Caroline had a bit of a brainwave. She said, you know, vice chancellors are competitive guys. At that stage, they were all men. If we create a prize for the most friendly university, They'll compete. Well, we hadn't any funds. We were self-funded and we were pretty broke. But we put together enough money for a glass rose bowl and announced this competition. And Caroline was right. They did compete. And we ran it several years in a row and more and more competed. There were two groups that stood out one of which had an Athena project, so-called, and the other which had a scientific women's academic network, SWAN group. And with their permission, we took the best ideas from these two and put together the Athena SWAN project, which I'm sure many of you know plenty about. It's a scheme that recognizes how woman friendly is your department or your university. It involves a lot of self-assessment. It involves a lot of data collection. And people quickly find that the data banks were incompatible and it was quite a laborious job. But it did some good. 
And it started doing a lot of good when some funding bodies started taking an interest. And it was the chief medical officer for chief, yes, chief, Med, chief medical officer of Great Britain who led the way. She had been meeting with heads of medical schools, talking about things that heads of departments will talk about with funding bodies. She held a lot of research funding. And at the end of the meeting, she looked around and said, you're all men, where are the women? And he said, doesn't matter. And she had, as she put it, a rush of blood to the head. And she said, if you want to have my funding by such and such a date, you've got to hold Athena Swan Silver Award. And once a funder says something like that, people begin to take notice. And that was the beginning of funding bodies beginning to require research groups to hold Athena Swan Awards. So I know it's got rather top heavy. I know it's involved a lot of work for a number of people, but I am very, very proud that we, this small group of women, managed to turn around the situation the way we did. The project um, extended to the humanities, beyond science, where the issue is not where are the women often, but where are the men. And it's been extended to Ireland, to Australia, to Canada, and it's coming in in the USA, bound in with other minority issues as well, sea change. So it's gone a long way, and I'm really quite surprised. And I think it has helped a lot um, in creating an awareness of the ambiance in universities and departments. So I think I've probably said all of this. It's, yep, certainly has caused change to happen. However, there have been inevitably some spin-offs that are not entirely desirable. It is often the female members of staff, disproportionately, who are asked to take on the job of doing the Athena Swan submission. There are a number of women these days grousing that they get invited to job in interviews, not because they're considered particularly promising candidates, but simply to make up the number of female candidates. And certainly in Oxford, it has been the case that female members of staff have been over invited to be part of interview panels. And indeed, in one department, they went on strike. So the university had to train some younger women, which maybe wasn't a bad idea. Is this inevitable? Um, almost inevitable, certainly predictable, I fear. I want to switch now slightly in tack. Um, there is a management uh, company called McKinsey's who've done some interesting work on how companies function and which are the most successful. And they found that companies that have the most diverse executives and boards are more robust, more flexible and more successful than companies that are less diverse. And the diversity they're talking about is both gender diversity and ethnicity. And this seems to me to be very true. It also seems to me to be the case that physics departments are still often white male dominated. And that's why when I had some funding, I set up this graduate studentship scheme to increase diversity in physics. Those students, studentships are open to people from underrepresented in physics groups. Royal Society of Edinburgh recently did a Women in Science exhibition and they managed to get it into Edinburgh Airport. And the left hand photograph shows it by gate nine and all the passengers hanging around waiting to board, of course, have plenty of time to look at it. 
The right hand photograph shows that one of the portraits is replaced by a mirror. And this is so that girls and women can look at themselves in the mirror and think, one day I could be up on a display like this. Three million people passed through the airport while this exhibit was on display there. I wonder what the footfall in Oxford Railway Station is. It's pretty big, I guess. Maybe I should Google it. So where next? I don't know if others have come across this book by Tom Schuller, The Paula Principle. Not Peter, but Paula. He's noted, as many of us have, that women in the workplace are underestimated, underpromoted, underpaid. And he does not mean the academic workplace. He's talking about other kinds of workplaces and women who are involved in the trade union movement as well. And he's recognised that women want interesting jobs, not simply status and money. Which has led me to wonder, is our career progression, the criteria, the hierarchy, appropriate? If status and money aren't everyone's goals, how are we helping forward people who have other goals than status and money, like interesting jobs? Or are they just simply left behind? We're making quite good progress. Women in physics, women in astronomy, certainly making very good progress. We're enabling more women to climb up the ranks, like Ivy climbs up the wall of a building. But Ivy doesn't alter the structure of the building, at least not much. So are we enabling the women to be fully integrated to help change the structure if necessary? Or is it more like the Ivy climbing up the existing wall which remains unaltered? Maybe it's okay, it's unaltered. Or is it not okay? Should the structures change? Could the structures change? A point I think we need to think about. I'm going to talk a bit about women in astronomy worldwide today because there's some interesting lessons there for Britain. There is an international body called the International Astronomical Union which countries belong to and individuals in those countries can also belong to. And they publish on their website data about the number of individuals in each country, um, also by age as well as gender. Now, interestingly, I buy a, a note on the side, um, they only offer two gender options, male and female, female, male. Out of the 14,000 people whose data they have collected, only four have refused to specify whether they were female or male. That's an interestingly low number. Maybe the rest just went away. I've been following this data for a number of years and it's showing the growth in the number of women in astrophysics. I've looked at the countries with more than two astronomers, sorry, 200 astronomers um, who are, fe sorry, I've looked at countries which have more than 200 astronomers in membership and looked at the percentage of those who are female. The 200 is so that the root n error is not too large. And then I've listed them in order of female fraction. The world average as of June this year was 19% female. Italy is considerably better with 28%, France with 26%, Brazil with 23%, Spain with 22 
Russian Federation with 21, Netherlands on the world average at 19%. And here come the English speaking countries now below the average, Australia 18%, USA 17%, Canada 16%. UK used to be up in that batch, but it's dropped. India 14%, China 13%, Germany 13%, UK 13%, Japan 7%. So in the subject as a whole, it seems that not quite 20% are female, but there's a considerable range in the fraction that's female. And this must be something to do with the culture in the different countries. Um, perhaps it's not surprising to see Japan way low down um, and Germany probably way low down. Um, Southern Europe countries are high, Northern European countries are low, South America tends to be high. Well, go on. There's a lot of very interesting data in this. Now, over the last four years, the fraction of the world astronomy body that's female has risen from 17% to 19%. Um, there's been a slight change in the data collected during that time. And that's probably partly responsible for the jump in female membership. The countries that have improved most in the last four years are Netherlands, gone up a whopping 10% to 19% female, Chile, 15 to 21%, India, 9 to 14%. That's remarkable. Belgium, Germany, Italy, Mexico, South Korea, USA have all risen by, four, by 3%. We have fallen by 3%. Let's just stop and ask, how has the Netherlands, a typical Northern European country, managed to get its fraction of female astronomers almost doubled from 10% to 19%? And the answer is because they have been allowed in the last few years to recruit to the women-only positions to have positions open to women applicants only. And that, according to Dutch astronomers, has made a big difference. So that is an interesting development, which maybe others of us could learn from. Well, we must watch what happens in the Netherlands. Will there be any kind of backlash? Or is that really a useful step? Other things that I think would be better would be more child-minding facilities and cheaper, desperately cheaper, but child-minding facilities. Child care takes such a large fraction of academic salaries that you wonder why you do it. We need to continue to recognize unconscious bias and check on other assumptions. Um, for instance, I've sometimes wondered if Bello is maybe a slightly loaded, gender-loaded name. Uh, we're going to have to find a way of recognizing the effect on women, particularly, of homeworking during the COVID-9 lockdown and childcare responsibility. And we not only have to recognize the issues for women, but for other under-recognized underrepresented minorities. The world has changed. Um, in 1930, the Earl of Birkenhead was fool enough to predict what the world would like in 2030. In 2030, women will still, by their wit and charm, inspire the most talented men towards heights that they could themselves, never themselves achieve. Yeah. In 1946, in the USA, 65% of people thought men were smarter than women. By 2018, 86% think men and women are equally smart. So there is progress, but it is slow. One thing that has given me great hope, the Institute of Physics, particularly the East Midlands issue region, and the Girl Guiding have created a badge. I am a physicist badge. 
the Girl Guides Brownies and Rainbows. And as of November this year, 22,000 girls have done that badge. Folk, we ought to be building on this some way or doing more of it ourselves, maybe. For badge, to get a badge, it's required um, that the girls have some experience um, using only equipment and consumables that can be found in a supermarket. And there's some material provided for leaders. They have to create objects or devices to be built. They have to investigate what happens if dot, 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 and then discuss the results. And they have to either meet a physicist or visit a museum or science center or attend an IOP public event to hear about physics in action. 22,000 girls have done that. And the feedback, gee, is very positive. That's wonderful, that word cloud. And with that encouraging note, I will stop and say thank you for your attention. Thank you for your interest. And back to you, Alex. Thank you so much, Jocelyn. That talk was so interesting and at times heartbreaking and just all round has brought up so many important questions that I think we all need to be thinking about. Thank you so much. Um, we have a bunch of questions that I'll start making my way through with you. Um, Sorry, they're quite, some of them are quite long. Okay, so I, th I think there's a general um, discussion about, so you, you had the slide about the academic structure and about the ivy creeping up the walls. And my personal opinion is that we need to very much change the structure because it's just not working for so many people. And, um, one of the questions that we have here is someone asking, is it not the hierarchical systems that we have, which are one of the main reasons for discrimination? Like, can we actually treat people equally when someone is in a position of power and someone else is not? Um, what are your thoughts on that question? Um, I think you can actually. Um Power can be used or abused, and I think maybe it's not always used very intelligently. Um, this is not a criticism of the way physics is run at the moment. Um, so I don't know if any of the senior management team are listening in, but this is not a criticism of Oxford's physics department right now, so please don't feel it is. In fact, I, I think the physics department right now is in a good place to be honest and it is trying <laughs> but a lot of these issues are, are fairly structural. Um, I do believe you can have hierarchies and you can have power but responsibility of course goes with the power. Um, it's when the two get separated that sometimes the trouble occurs uh, and I think it's also fairly important that power and therefore responsibilities are rotated quite often so that power doesn't become entrenched. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, sorry, there's so many questions that I've tried to... Um, so one question that's not in the chat because we as hosts can't answer the question. Um, so the UK government recently announced that they would no longer require universities to work towards Athena Swan to get fun, certain types of funding. How do you feel about that? How do you think that's going to change things? I feel a bit sad about that. Um, but I do recognise that it had got quite cumbersome. Um, I would have been happier if they'd said we need to um, make it a bit simpler and more straightforward rather than saying we do without it. Um, mm -hmm. I, I worry slightly that, more than slightly, that actually in terms of gender bias, racial bias and so on, we will slip back. Yeah. Uh, I feel like this government in particular is not necessarily that good at looking after the underrepresented groups. Um, so I think that is a, a real worry. 
Um, so I think this is a really good question. So you, for a lot of people, are such a big role model in terms of like just being a physicist, um, and particularly for us women, like to see someone such as yourself who's now like so eminent, it's really encouraging. And one of the questions here says that when you discovered radio pulsars, what made you feel confident in your discovery when so many people around you weren't supportive and didn't perhaps believe in your scientific abilities? Hmm. Uh, looking back, I can see that I was suffering from imposter syndrome. Uh -huh. you know, I had the right to be in Cambridge and I wasn't bright enough. The way I was coping with that was by working very, very, very hard. I was being incredibly thorough. So I knew what I was talking about when I said there's a funny signal here. Um, Maybe it took me slightly longer to twig that there was a funny signal there than it should have. But by the time I twigged, um, I had plenty of evidence to support my statements. Mm -hmm. And it was just a case of <laughs> waiting for everybody else to catch up, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I just want to add on to that. Like, did you ever feel like a bit helpless with your situation? Like, I know that's something that graduate students like today struggle with. Like sometimes, you know, you can feel I like I've read interviews with you where you've discussed issues with, for instance, like the graduate student supervisee relationship. And like, did you ever have times when you felt like, oh, I don't know if I can do this. And like, what kind of helped you get through that? Uh, when I arrived in Cambridge, um, I was quite sure I shouldn't be there. As I say, I was suffering from imposter syndrome. But because I had resolved to work as hard as I could, so that when they threw me out, I wouldn't feel guilty, um, I had a lot of hard work under my belt. And I knew what I was talking about, and I didn't talk about more than I knew about. Put it that way. Um, so my, the, the objects I found were so preposterous, my supervisor was inclined to suspect there was something wrong. And that's always a good approach anyway, when you find something curious, you know, try and prove that it's, it's a funny effect of the receiver and the instrument or, you know, it's some funny instrumental quirk, it's not real. And trying to prove that um, is, is quite a good approach to establishing a result, particularly a somewhat outrageous result like Pulsar's were. Thank you. Um, there's two questions that I think we can smush into one here. So the first one is, why do you think so many young girls tend to turn away from pursuing physics? And then the second question is, what advice would you give to like, younger women students who want to become an astrophysicist? Um, one of the things about British society that concerns me, and if I hadn't had too much material already, I would have put in my talk, is girls' toys are pink, boys' toys are blue, girls' toys tell girls that they're meant to be pretty, sociable, helpful, demure. Boys' toys tell them that they're going to be leaders, intellectually challenging, challenging their dexterity and so on. Blue toys for boys, pink toys for girls. And it has reached, I think, a shocking level in Britain of blue and pink. You know, little princess kits for girls and construction kits for boys kind of thing. And that sends a not very subtle gender message from a very, very, very early age. And one of the things I support is a campaign called Let Toys Be Toys. You know, don't make them blue and pink, make them green and purple or anything other than blue and pink. So that it's not obvious which gender they're intended for and both genders can play with whatever kinds of toys they like. But again, there's quite a lot of pressure. Um, you know, girls will get given dolls and toy cookers and <laughs> Russian pan sets. <laughs> and so it goes on. 
So there's this quite a lot of societal pressure, which um, tends to drive girls away from science. Medicine's probably okay, that's caring, but any other science, nope. And do you have any words of advice for young women who might want to become astrophysicists? I'd say go for it. It's huge fun. Uh, it's a very rapidly moving field. There are amazing developments rolling in one after the other. Very dynamic, very exciting. And it's quite thrilling to be dealing with some of the biggest things in the universe as well. So I, to my mind, uh, it's got a lot going for it. Uh, and provided you've got a good grip on physics and maths, you can have a fantastic time. Thank you. Um, I feel like that could apply to all areas of physics as well. Um, so you've spoken about the disruption that constantly having to move had on your career. And there does seem to be somewhat of this culture within not just physics, but in academia that you kind of have to move institutions and make sure you work in different countries to prove yourself as, you know, like an international collaborative scientist. Mm -hmm. Do you think that disproportionately affects women in physics? Because, you know, if you have families, for instance, you can't just up and move them all the time. It shouldn't affect single women any more than it affects single men. But once you're in a relationship and once there are children, then you're not as independent and there are other people to think of. And I guess it's still the case because having children disrupts a woman's career more than a man's career. When it comes to the crunch, it's maybe the man's career that takes precedence. And so the woman gives up her job and moves with the man to somewhere. So we don't live in a totally equal world, I'm afraid. No, sadly not. <laughs> um, this is a really interesting question for me to ask you. Um, what kind of backlash or resistance have you faced when you've tried to implement anything to tackle, for instance, gender inequality and underrepresentation of other groups in physics? Like, did you experience a lot of backlash to Athena Swan when you were setting that up? No, not when we were setting it up. We didn't actually. Um, at least I don't recall any, uh, I must say. The, the main, it wasn't a backlash, there was grousing because people were trying to put together data sets from this department and that department and the central university and none of the data sets were in the same format. So there was craziness as well as that that caused an awful lot of hassle, but which have gradually got straightened out as Athena Swan has run, um, which is probably useful to university management in a number of ways. So I wasn't too aware of backlash. There were inevitably people who failed the Athena Swan on their first submission and weren't terribly happy and, you know, how could this happen to us, blah, 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 we do this, that and the other. Well, put this, that and the other in your case then. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's never straightforward bringing in new things like that. But I was pleasantly surprised that it wasn't, wasn't worse. And several of the early winners of gold awards were very generous spending time talking about what they did and what they had done and how they got gold, which I think was a help to everybody. Yeah. Um, do you have any advice for people perhaps like in encountering backlash in their work to try and improve the culture because it is there <laughs> and I think sometimes it can feel like the activities that we're trying to do aren't making a difference or that it feels like we can't do things to make a difference. Whereas like to me, the Athena Swan Charter is something that like really changed things at a fundamental level. And I think those are the sort of programs we need to be trying, but it can feel really hard trying to work out how to do things like that. I think we have to recognize that change comes slowly. 
And just because something you're working on doesn't seem to produce an immediate change doesn't actually mean it's failed. It just means your time constant's wrong. Okay. And a lot of it is a sort of steady drip, drip, drip process. Okay, that's encouraging. Thank you. Um, oh, sorry. Um, oh, someone has asked, do you have any books that you recommend? if they wanted to pursue a career in astrophysics? Um, websites might be more useful than books, to be honest. Um, but there are, there are lots of sort of color picture books of astronomical objects. Um, If you're going to pursue a career in astrophysics, you're probably going to have to do a physics degree or a lot of physics in your degree, which also means maths. So be aware of that. And if you don't like physics or you don't like maths, maybe you need to think of something else if you want to spend your life doing it. Um, I think apart from saying that, I'm not sure I can help much more, you know, off the cuff. That's very fair. Thank you. Um, we're getting close to the end, so I'm probably only going to ask you one more question. But I wanted to say that we have so many people thanking you in the chat for your talk and saying how encouraged they feel and that they really feel that they needed to hear this from you. So I just thought I'd add that because I feel that way as well. I, like, I was so excited to hear you talk because... I think you're a very inspirational speaker with the way you talk about the issues. So thank you from myself and everyone. Um, and then the final question, how would you envisage an, a scientific, so like an academic structure that wasn't motivated by the competition and desire for status? Yeah, so it would be motivated by discovering things about the universe. So the universe in its wider sense, not just astronomical, but all the way down to small things as well. Um, it's, it's just somebody who likes, or people who like finding out things. But it's going to be hard to get rid of competition totally, because you're going to need money to do that research. And money is usually allocated on a competitive basis. And indeed, one of the very encouraging things right now in Britain is, for instance, EPSERC worrying about gender bias in its um, allocation of funding, research funding and fellowships. Um, so things do keep changing. I, I think you probably can't get rid of, rid of competition totally unless you find a millionaire who's willing to fund you, no questions asked. And then instead of dealing with competitiveness, you're dealing with a funder who may have their own ideas about what's important to look at, look for, doesn't interest you. <laughs> so there often isn't a simple way out of the issues many of us face. Yeah, that's, that's very true. I guess we just all have to try and do our part to try and change the structure mm -hmm. and improve it for people. Um, well, that leads us to the end. So once again, I would like to thank you so much for such a brilliant talk. And it really, it really has been incredibly motivating for a lot of us. And we all really appreciate you taking the time to come and talk to us and share your journey and your thoughts and your work with us. Um, and also, I'd like to thank the um, other members of the Challenges and Changes team, in particular, in particular, Catherine, who has been working tirelessly behind the scenes to make sure this all works in spite of my efforts to crash the Zoom call um, by accident. So thank you to everyone. Thank you to the attendees. And I really hope you can all join us next year for our new talks. And yeah, I hope everyone has a wonderful rest of your afternoon. Thank you. <laughs>